All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rob Daly. I'm a senior systems engineer with SwiftStack. This is Doug Soltes. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Doug Soltes. I'm a senior solutions manager at SwiftStack. And uh, our SwiftStack booth is right over there, so check these guys out after the uh, presentation. How's everybody doing today, all right? Everybody good? How's, How's everyone SwiftStack doing? people doing? <laughs> <laughs> So we're here today, we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, erasure codes, which is something new uh, within Swift. And what we want to do is give you a real quick rundown of Swift and erasure codes. And then what Doug is going to do is give you uh, a real live demo of uh, using erasure codes within a Swift uh, cluster. So what are erasure codes, if you don't already know? So erasure codes, really the, the concept is to be able to store the same amount of data that you have but use less capacity to protect it, right? Or originally, the way Swift was written is that we use replicas to protect our data, right? To, to maintain a level of data durability. With erasure codes, we want to meet that same level of data durability, but use less capacity to do so, right? So from a, a kind of low-level perspective, right? The way that erasure codes are implemented are just a you know, traditional Reed solomon algorithm, and you can tune how many uh, segments or fragments you want to use for parity versus how many you use for data. And those are all tunables that you can choose for different uh, ways of storing the data that you have. Now, it's not a silver bullet for every use case that you have. And, and Doug and I are going to talk a little bit about what good use cases are for erasure codes. But again, it's not a silver bullet. There are still use cases where you're going to want to use replicas to save and, and protect and, and uh, store your data. Um, where it makes more sense to do it that way versus using erasure codes for that data. And there are policies and ways to, to leverage both within a, a, a Swift environment, and we're going to show that to you. So from a, a Swift perspective of erasure codes, this is something that's been uh, coming for a while, right? This is something that has been worked on for close to about two years now, and there's been contributions from a lot of people, right? SwiftStack has helped lead the way alongside with Intel, has, has made major contributions, Red Hat, and other members of the, of the community to be able to make this happen. And, and erasure codes have just been released with the Kilo version of Swift, version 2.3.0. And now it's, it's still considered beta, and really it's just because it's a new feature within Swift, right? Um, so it's still considered beta, but it's out there, it's, it's available to use now, and, and we encourage you to start testing it out and, and uh, leveraging it uh, for your applications. Uh, how do I implement a erasure-coded policy? Storage policies were introduced going about a year or so ago. And storage policies allow me to have different types of protection for my data. So in other words, I could have one container of data that is replica-based, uh, replica and I can have another container using a storage policy that's erasure code-based. And Doug is going to show you how that's done. Today, the, it's somewhat of a pluggable architecture. I can choose different types or different libraries that actually do the erasure coding for me. So today what we're going to show you is an implementation of Intel's uh, library that is doing the erasure coding. There are other ones out there like J-Erasure, XOR, that you're able to use uh, to be able to, use to uh, erasure encode your data. Uh, and then finally, we're still using the same mechanisms to place these uh, erasure coded bits across your cluster, right? So Swift's guarantee for data is to be able to distribute it widely across the disk space that it has available and do it in an intelligent manner that it can always be redundant in, in uh, the event of a failure of any component. And we're still using that same placement algorithm. We're just doing it a little bit differently using erasure codes. So what we're going to show you today is how to create an erasure coded storage policy, right? And what we're going to do is use uh, the Swift Stack interface. We have a, a web console within our product. And through our web interface, what you can do is you can create a new storage policy and all the things that I was discussing, right? How many fragments of actual data do I want to split my object into? How many parity bits, parity fragments, do I want to make part of that, um, part of that protection scheme that I have? And Doug's going to go over all this in, in a little bit more detail. So um, we'll, we'll get to what some of, some of these variables actually uh, uh, encompass. So just to give you a quick rundown of what we've got, we've got a SwiftStack controller. It's just our software running in a lab environment. 
And that controller is managing, well, several clusters, but the cluster we're going to be showing you has roughly 15 storage nodes uh, with a bunch of disks attached to them, uh, a couple storage policies already deployed to them, and some proxy nodes in front. Proxy, if you're not familiar with Swift, proxy nodes are responsible for routing the requests that come into your back-end storage, and they're kind of the intelligence for figuring out where to place data, where to retrieve data from, and uh, so that's the architecture that we have in the lab today that Doug is going to show you right now. Thank you, Rob. All right, so let's uh, hope that the demo gods favor us. All right, so I'm going to start off in the Swift Stack home site. So Swift Stack, if you don't already know, is a very simple way to get a Swift node up and running. It gives you pure OpenStack Swift, but then on top of that, we give you a managed UI. We make it extremely easy to deploy, to monitor, can you up my volume? Uh, make it easy to deploy and to monitor. So I have a uh, environment, and the environment has been built special for Vancouver. It is a 16 node cluster, 15 storage nodes. And so I'm going to go in and manage that. Uh, I can show you those nodes. Again, nice and easy through the interface. And what I want to do right now is create a new storage policy. So as Rob said, in the Kilo release, storage policies came out. And storage policies allow me to have multiple rings guaranteeing different durability for my data. So I'm going to look. And right now, I've got two storage policies implemented. One of them is a replicated one that gives me three replicas. Another one is currently erasure coded. And it's going to give me seven data bits and five parity bits. So anytime I send some data to that storage policy, it's going to be broken into 12 segments. And I only need any seven to reconstruct the data. So to show you how easy it is to create a new storage policy, we click Create New Storage Policy. And so I'm going to call this one EC 10-4 because I want 10 data bits and 4 parity bits. Now, I could pick any values I want. If I want an 8 by 7, if I want a 19 by 3, and that all really depends on what makes sense for your environment. I would highly recommend that you have at least as many nodes as the total amount of pieces that you break your data into because what you don't want is to be storing multiple pieces on the same node because Swift wants to be as resilient as possible. So the first thing I need to do is I need to drop down to policy type, and I'm going to switch that over to erasure coding. And as you can see, the screen auto adjusts and gives me a few new options. I can pick if this is going to be my default storage policy, which um, I don't want it to be. I can pick my partition power. Partition power, and there's a good example down at the bottom of the page, tells me how even I'm going to distribute my data in the Swift cluster. And so it tells you if I had a partition power of 16, this would be a great cluster until I exceeded 1,966 disk. So I think we're going to be just fine with a uh, partition power of 16. Uh, as Rob mentioned, there are multiple erasure coding libraries, but we're going to pick the one from Intel. That's the one that ships standard with Swift Stack. And it's actually hardware accelerated if you're running the Intel Xeon platform. And so again, um, erasure coding works through a CPU cycle. There's your trade-off. You gain some space, but at the expense of using more CPU, if you have a proper Intel chipset and you're able to leverage hardware accelerated um, uh, erasure coding, that's going to be a big benefit. And then down here, I can pick the amount of data fragments. So we're going to leave that as the default 10 because I named this one 10.4. And uh, we can pick the number of parity fragments. But again, you're totally free to change that to 6 if you so desire. And then lastly, we're going to pick the amount of data that the proxy node will receive before it starts chunking things up. And right now, we have that set to a megabyte. And that seems to be a very good tunable. So nice and easy, I'm going to click, <coughs> click Create Storage Node. And so I've created this new storage node right down here. I'm sorry, Storage Policy with Erasure Coding. Uh, now if I want, just to show you a little bit more Swift Stack before I, I jump into the um, actually putting demo uh, data into this uh, cluster. Uh, you can see all my different nodes. If I wanted to manage one of my nodes and assign that to certain disk, storage policy allows you to pick what nodes and what disk get this policy. So you can see that right now I have a group that gives certain disk the standard replica policy and my current EC7 policy. I can click right here, add or remove policies. I can take that new 10 by 4 and I can choose to add it immediately to these disk. 
And it's really as simple as that to get those added. Hey Doug, what's the, the difference between, and my mic is on, what's the difference between gradually and immediately adding that capacity into the storage policy? Sure, so immediate says that I want to consume this immediately. It says, go ahead and set it up. And the only reason you'd want to do immediate is when you first create a storage policy. Otherwise, if you have a bunch of disk and you've already got data on them and you have data in your storage policy today, your 10 by 4, and then you swap out your disk with um, from 4 terabyte drives to 8 terabyte drives, or you add a bunch of new nodes, you're going to want to do that gradually because what Swift's going to do is immediately try to distribute that data as unique as possible. So it's going to be moving things around on the back end, and gradual is going to make sure that there is no performance impact to your environment while the data is getting replicated and moved around to ensure that it's even better protected in case of a hardware failure. So it's a much safer means for adding capacity into an already existing an existing cluster. It is, so normally you should definitely pick the gradual button, um, force a habit for me with demos picking the, uh, the immediate button. And then if I wanted to deploy this, um, I could just go right back to, to my cluster, I could hit manage and I can hit deploy. But um, instead of having you watch a screen where I deploy this, what I'm going to do, actually, is stay in there. I'm going to go over to my Swift web client. So there's multiple ways to look at my object store, one of which is to go to any proxy node, and I can see the containers that I already have and the accounts that I have set up. So if I wanted to create a new container for storing data in, I can simply click the plus. I can pick different um, storage policies I've defined. Our 10.4 isn't there because I didn't hit the deploy button on the last screen and I can pick a standard one and I can call this you know, documents and hit OK and I'm going to have a new container. Now obviously this is a pretty rudimentary console. There are other consoles out there that are available. So for free you can download uh, Cyberduck which is a um, open source um, system and so let's refresh this. Hope my VPN tunnel didn't and what, what I think is really cool about this, right, is what Doug's showing you is different ways of accessing this. But what's really interesting is where Doug has signed in and authenticated into the cluster, he's got right now two different containers, right? And in terms of the application or the users that are touching those, they all look the same. On the back end, they're being used very differently, right? I have one that's erasure coded and is splaying out the data over many disks into many different fragments. And then I have another container that's just using a replica policy, but again, all within my account space of the cluster. So I, I can pick and choose again. I, I think that's a powerful feature. So my Cyberduck token obviously has expired, but instead of re-authenticating there, I've opened up Cloudberry, and uh, you can see I have my new documents container. And if I right click on it and I look at the HTTP headers, we can see that this one's protected by standard replication. Whereas if I look at my EC data container that I created, and I look at the headers, I can see that this one's protected by my EC75 storage policy. And of course, I can create as many containers as I want. Um, in fact, there's a great use case for creating very many containers and try, instead of trying to put billions of objects into a single container. So now, I can upload an object. So if I want to take my keynote from this morning where I spoke on Swift 102 and put that into the um, EC demo folder, I can just click and drag it over and copy it up. And while that is copying up, I'd like to prove to you that we've actually separated the data into 12 chunks because I have a 7.5. So I'm in one of the storage nodes, and this is getting a little bit deeper, but OpenStack Swift has a uh, command called Swift Git Nodes, and I'm able to run Swift Git Nodes, and I'm able to um, tell it the account, the data, and the ring, I'm sorry, the account, the container, and the object that I'd like to access. And so when I do that, I can see that my data has been split, if we count these, across 12 different locations. So based on the name of that object, what Swift returns to you in this command are the locations that all of that data is being placed. And we can see 12 different locations here. Can you explain a little maybe about what these handoff locations are, are there for? Sure, so if I tell Swift to break my data into 12 pieces, imagine that one of those nodes is offline. 
if one of those nodes is offline, I don't want to just discard that piece of data. So handoff locations are backups. So if you look at my um, IP addresses here, I've got 72, 77, 71. These are all different nodes. It's going to try to, as uniquely as possible, distribute the data across all those nodes. And of course, my first handoff node is number 75, is IP address. And because I'm splitting my data 12 ways, and I actually have 15 nodes, my first few handoffs are unique to the other um, actual sites. If Swift can, in all instances, it will keep the data as far apart as possible. So if I had 30 nodes, none of the handoff locations would overlap any of the actual data storage locations. But because I'm splitting it to 12 pieces, if I was to lose three of my nodes, then by the pigeonhole mathematics, there must be two pieces of data on the same server. And it will be able to recalculate, recover, and move those around um, dynamic. But again, those handoff locations, I think of them as like hotels, right? When the primary locations that are up there are not available for the erasure coded bits, they're just going to be temporarily stored in these handoff locations until the primaries become available again. So I think of it as like a hotel for your yeah. data, right? Those are That's a good analogy. Now, backup locations. we're running a little short on time. Normally what I do is I would jump into one of these directories and show you the little piece of data. But instead of doing that, let's jump back to the keynote, the slide deck because there is a little bit more information I'd like to give you when we start talking about uh, erasure coding, and specifically around disk use space. So the question is, how much data space is this going to save me? Because again, we're saving space. So we use a, a pretty simple example here, and we're going to say that we're going to split our data 15 ways. And 10 of those are going to be data bits, and five of those are going to be um, parity bits. Now again, they're not truly parity bits because we can pick any 10 we want. So the mathematical formula is actually really, really simple. We take the total number of pieces we're splitting our data into, in this case 10 plus 5, 15, and we divide it by the amount of data bits I need to reconstruct, which means that 15 divided by 10 is 1.5. So for every megabyte of data that I send the Swift cluster, it will result in a use case or a use of one and a half megabytes of actual data being consumed out of my Swift cluster. Now, if you compare this to a uh, replica system of making three replicas, there's clearly a savings there. In fact, it's about a 50% savings. Again, the trade off is I'm going to be using more CPU resource to do the data calculation. The other trade off is if I have small objects, and I'm splitting them up 15 ways, I'm using more IOPS on my disk. So by default, I'm using a minimum of 15 IOPS, whereas if I use replicas and I take a small object and I split it three ways, I'm only using three IOPS. And of course, as the object size grows, there's going to be a point where those lines cross and erasure coding can actually be more efficient or a faster use case for big objects. All right, so let's go back to use case because we didn't have uh, a slide on that and we actually do have a minute and 52 minute seconds remaining. So what are the use cases for erasure code? I know everybody wants to throw erasure code, erasure code, erasure code at everything. And as Rob explained, it's new out. It's technically considered beta. You know, you do want to make sure because it just came out with the, uh, the, the Kilo release that um, you test it thoroughly first. But Erasure coding makes a lot of sense when we start talking about data that's going to live in a single geographic location because it's going to save you space and it doesn't need to go other locations. And why do I say that? Well, if I had some, some important file and I want it split between San Francisco, I want to have it available, San Francisco, Texas, and New York. What's going to happen is if I use replicas, I would set my replica count to three, and that object will live in all three of those data centers. And when I access that object, it's right in that data center and it's locally available, and I can even lose two whole data centers before I lose an object. Right. But if I use a 10 by five, what's going to happen is I'm going to split that object into 15 pieces, and each of those data centers is going to get five pieces. But in order to reconstruct my data, from any of those data centers, I must pull five pieces from another data center. So either I need to pull five from one, or two and three, or any combination four and one. That's going to add latency, especially when we start talking about geographic distances. It's also going to add 
um, a lot of bandwidth. And right now, bandwidth across your pipe is actually more expensive than disk bandwidth on a spinning disk. So erasure coding makes a lot of sense to me when we start talking about a video surveillance system uh, for backups that live right at one site. And then of course, if you went to my talk earlier today, Swift 102, you'd know that you can create multiple storage policies and through a thing called server-side copy, you can actually have your backups going to an erasure coded um, container on site and then through server-side copy, moving that to a replicated one that expands or beyond a multiple geographic cluster. So I think, I think we're I out think of time, but time. hopefully we gave you guys a, a good overview of what Swift has added in terms of erasure codes, how you can leverage Swift Stack to be able to uh, implement that, test it. Uh, we encourage you to come over to our booth. It's right over there. There's, there's a bunch of eager people ready to talk to you about all this stuff. Um, again, thank you very much for your time. If you've got any questions, please, Doug and I will be over there at the, uh, at the booth. And check our blog. There will be up and coming performance and other benchmarks on erasure coding as uh, this gets deployed more in the lab. Great. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.